Thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much for the introduction. Um, yeah, as uh, Jan says, I'm coming from a background in political science, but at a young age really started cycling, essentially. I grew up in the Midlands of the UK in a quite sort of post-industrial, slightly depressed town with not a lot going on. Um, had my bicycle and loved the way that it could take me out of that town. Um, after university, I cycled to Istanbul and fell in love with the fact that I could cross a continent in a month with only my legs and my bicycle. Um, in Istanbul, I discovered that the world record for a circumnavigation by bicycle was being broken in this very kind of corporate-backed corporate attempt that was sort of at odds with all that I'd found travel by bicycle to be. Um, and so I set out to break that record, and, and this sort of led me to the, the genre, if you like, of uh, politics at roadsides, basically. Um, as Jan says, the book that I'm talking about today is, is Interstate from the United States, um, which is actually more of a hitchhiking book. Um, there are some kind of correlations or contrasts between travel by bike and, and hitchhiking in the US, which I'll come on to. Um, but having cycled 6,000 miles across the US and then hitchhiked maybe 4,000 miles, it's kind of different perspectives on, on that country. Um, that you find again at the roadsides and, and the title of Interstate was kind of no coincidence in that respect. Um, starting out then at the beginning of the trip, um, which began in New York City, as we can see, an image we're all pretty familiar with. Um, and I had gone there to work on a documentary project that that year failed to materialise. Um, interestingly enough, that was taking a boat down the Hudson River from the Adirondack Mountains um, to, the Ma to Manhattan. The boat was made from rubbish that was found on the streets of the city, and the idea was to ret take it to the source of the river in nature and return it to the metropolis. Um, so that's another kind of interesting element that came into my relationship with the US and, and with New York State. And that diversity that you see in a population, as, as soon as you kind of leave the hubs of airport terminal to airport terminal or office to office when you go through the sort of space between those places whether that's on a road or whether that's off the road or at the roadside hitchhiking or, or on the river um, that doesn't have the same the geographies that don't have the same kind of regard for place as the very kind of charted existences that we as humans often sort of lead in our in our ways of going between countries around a country and between cities um, the book um, begins in, in New York and actually, oddly enough, with today being local elections in London, I was out um, canvassing with a friend for the de Blasio campaign um, of Bill de Blasio, who I think got elected in 2013 with a majority of about 70% on a very low voter turnout. And in some ways that kind of frames the start of the book because you see this kind of metropolitan elite or, or elite question mark. Um, this bubble existence of Brooklyn with the sourdough bread and, and the spinach and the salmon um, and the coffee and all of the things that we know and love and like. Um, electing this apparently progressive politician in the same way that London would have ele elected Sadiq Khan or we see the rising popularity of Jeremy Corbyn and you see this optimism for the future and progressive ideals and then crossing over the, Bro uh, the, the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan and then the George Washington Bridge out of, out of Manhattan into New Jersey. I, I don't mean, hopefully there's no one from New Jersey here, but I don't want to sort of do that thing of presenting New, Jer New Jersey as the frontiers of the Badlands. I really like New Jersey. Some of my best friends are from New Jersey. Um, and um, taking this shot on the way out, and, and then you're kind of, you land on the other side into this less controlled existence where you're not sure exactly where you're going and what's happening next. Um, hitchhiking. Um, the sign as you can imagine, is, is quite important when, when you're hitchhiking. Um, I headed into, uh, towards Ohio. Um, my first destination that I had vaguely in mind was Columbus, so for that I needed to go through New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and discovered, at the time I didn't know that Pennsylvania was called the wide state, but it certainly made sense after a while, and I ended up cheating a little bit on the hitchhiking. That was the only time and I got a greyhound for a couple of hundred miles to get to Columbus, just to, to get me moving. Um, the sign and the nature of standing at the roadsides in the US is kind of a, 
a particular thing. Uh, I think the first sign that I had and that I held up just said West. Uh, the project in, in the US, in, in New York, had fallen through for that year, so I was there in New York with no real plans, having rented out my room in Dalston, and so thinking, well, I should really go to California and hitchhike there. Um, it seemed like a sensible enough thing to do. Uh, and I started with my very enigmatic, evocative West sign and then realised that nobody was picking me up. Uh, so then I started adding more, more words to it, uh, like Ohio or then please. Uh, and suddenly you realise that your very simple looking sign that you really want to catch the driver's attention is suddenly looking quite cluttered. Uh, so you get a new bit of cardboard and start again. And it's kind of an iteration of that again and again until you find something that seems to work. I remember this sign with Ohio, a guy who picked me up and gave me a ride, said, uh, well, you're going to Ohio and I'm going there next week, so I thought I'd pick you up. And then after that, I thought, okay, I'm always going to put a place name on it. Um, and it was interesting that in the United States, you have so many people just standing at roadsides, just moving. Um, and you have so many people in the US. It's a very migratory culture, I think, the States has a strong kind of notion of traveling within your country, seeing your country. Um, and there are a lot of people at those roadsides that I, I think, were they in Europe, possibly wouldn't have fallen so far out of the bottom of society. Some of them, I think, might be getting professional help. I spoke to a guy in New Mexico who was, he'd lost the front of his teeth to presumably Class A drugs and smoking them. Um, he told me that he'd just buried his mother in Texas. Uh, and this was all within the first two minutes of meeting him. And so you kind of get to understand why people are driving straight by you at the roadside and, and not picking you up. So actually writing a destination on your sign came to feel like a, a statement of intention and a statement of purpose. Um, and I found, it, I found that it got me more lift. So there was also things about how I would stand at the roadside. Um, sometimes you'd just sort of lazily be there like that with your thumb out and then realise you're not getting any lifts. So you think maybe I should put some more effort into this and be a bit more upright. Sometimes I'd kind of be zipped right up because it was cold and then I thought well maybe that looks a little bit robotic and, and inhuman so you sort of unzip and relax a little bit. And again with these hours and hours at the roadside you're just kind of slowly trying to figure out actually what is going to work, what is going to get one of these cars to stop. Um, and, and pick me up. Um, when you're actually in the car, um, it, it's an interesting experience. Um, has anyone hitchhiked here before? Oh, cool, that's a really great percentage. No normally when I do a talk about it, it's probably about one or two hands at most. Um, but I've hitchhiked kind of like out of desperation for the like, sort of attention. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did it work? Yes. Yeah. In Tex oh, Texas is a great place to hitchhike. In fact, Texas isn't necessarily the best place to try and cycle because every time you stop at the roadside with your map, in the days when maps were made of paper, um, someone pulls in with a pickup saying, we can put your bike in the back of you. Like, you're like, no, I'm doing this for fun. And they're like, you're sure? <laughs> um, so, yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the experience of it where you're kind of strangers, complete strangers, and then placed into this automobile confessional booth almost because you've got to keep one another's company for whatever amount of time you will um, and that's a finite amount of time and you, you don't know the person but at the same time you need to talk about something and so the tendency is to talk about the things that actually matter you talk about well why are you doing this and it's like well there's a project that's fallen through and I thought I'd go to California where are you driving well I'm driving home to visit my kids uh, me and my me and the wife separated uh, or I'm driving home from work I don't much like it so in this sort of automotive 21st century environment of the car or 20th century I'd say more the car you end up talking quite quickly about the things that actually matter and in a world where increasingly uh, communication pathways and, and the objects the people that we are actually communicating with are ever more controlled and, and perhaps we become ever more uh, wary of leave it, leaving those controlled pathways the random encounter of I've got the trust to be standing at a roadside and requesting a lift and you've got the random trust to, to pull in and say yeah I'm going to give you one gives you that sort of connection just for a short time um, and it kind of um, yeah it kind of brings out a certain bond between people who actually might be very different they might be Republican voters they might be Democrat voters um, they might be immigrants they they might identify as being settlers from uh, you know 
the, the first Scots that went over to the US, but they've all got the idea to, to pick up this stranger at the roadside. Um, this is an older photo, actually, and goes back to the point uh, I touched on earlier of uh, the differences between cycling and hitchhiking in the United States. Um, this guy was Super Dave, <laughs> as, he, as he went known. Uh, this is from 2009 when I was cycling the west coast um, of California. Um, and he had two trailers here. He had a dog that ran along with him. Uh, he had a story, um, as everyone traveling the US has a story. His, um, his destination on the roadside was basically to get down to Santa Barbara. He was from Washington, and Washington State, of course, has a very cold winter. So he was moving south uh, to get warm for winter, which is a fairly timeless um, and, and distressingly common migration within, within the US. I, I met another guy on that same trip um, who was from Montana, which is, of course, also bitterly cold winters, and he was cycling down into New Mexico for, for winter uh, just to stay warm. So, again, you, you have this um, the hard reality of, of life for tens or hundreds of thousands or millions of people in the richest country in the world. Um, but nevertheless, at, at all times, kind of connected to this uh, eternally optimistic spirit these guys living by bicycle. Uh, I remember Mike, the guy from Montana, telling me that um, he, uh, he was all right out on the bike because he could see the stars at night, and if he could see the stars at night, he knew that Jesus was watching out for him. Um, and that same sort of good feeling that the guys on bikes have out, um, have out there seems to get reflected back at it by the US population. And uh, the, the amount of money, for example, that I was given um, having never once asked for it while cycling across the US um, was unfathomable to me. I'd had uh, bicycle repairs that needed doing and, and strangers fronting up $100 because they wanted to pay for them. Um, I had a family from South Carolina who took me in and paid for another set of repairs and wanted to set me off with $100 to put me on my way. Uh, I rode 300 miles in, a, in, in one long stretch to get to, to New York in time for a friend. Um, and crossing into, into Delaware, uh, had a woman wind down the car window and say, you're doing something here, amazing here, and just pass out $10 for me. And I'm like, well, I think I am, but how did you? <laughs> um, and the contrast between that and hitchhiking was, was actually really difficult because I'd gone there in the past and had this sense of being kind of welcomed and supported at the roadside because I think something about the bicycle appeals to that US spirit of, of bootstrapping, you know. They assume you're homeless. It doesn't matter that your bicycle is made in an like, artisan bike factory in um, the south of Germany uh, or that your pannier bags and your Brooks saddle were made by, um, you know, craftsmen in, in the Midlands or elsewhere in Germany and it's collectively worth a thousand or so pounds. There's an assumption that if you're travelling the estates on a bicycle, you're a homeless person. But they think you're a really good homeless person, you know. You're, you're actually trying. Um, and it's kind of ironic because one of the things I love about travel by bike is you're, you're really independent. It's a machine that keeps going. Uh, it's rare that it would have a mechanical that would stop you from going. And even if it has a minor mechanical, you can generally keep going. So you can be independent. Whereas when you're actually standing at the roadside waiting for a ride, needing a ride, you are re entirely reliant and, and dependent upon the people passing you. And whereas I'd had the ability to keep going on a bicycle myself, and nevertheless been met with all of this help. Uh, as a hitchhiker, stuck in the middle of a desert waiting for someone to pick you up, and being met with this constant mistrust and fear, it, it was a kind of war of attrition a little bit, and the, the determination required to sort of not be kind of worn down by this constant rejection that's going on um, was actually one of the most difficult things about the journey. I, I kind of will definitely cut some slack to the US population and the, the driver population of the US. Um, I mean, Hunter S. Thompson called the US the kingdom of fear. Um, and much as I think that there's an awful lot of unjustified fear in American society, American popular culture, American news stroke entertainment, um, I do think, as I say, there are a lot of people on, this, on the uh, interstates and highways of the US 
who in Europe would be either getting professional help or would simply not be there because migrating south for winter is something that doesn't really belong in the 21st century uh, wealthy nations. Um, but I, I sympathise um, with the American population because it's, yeah, it's a hard place out there. Um, the interstate is, um, is in itself its own kind of place. Uh, this was just... Um, a photo that I found while I was pulling out the other ones, but this was to, um, in America, say, air up your tires, which was an interesting phraseology for me. The first time I asked on a bicycle, can I pump up my tires? And the guy said, you want to air up your tires? Well, yeah, that makes sense as well. Um, but yeah, putting a dollar in, into it to help um, feed children elsewhere in the States. Um, and then these kind of thousands of miles of, of empty highways, um, and as I say, it's kind of a culture all, all of its own, really, um, with the highways, the truck stops, uh, and again, the space in between, and not a whole lot happening because people are going between rest areas, and you just see these, these desert stretches um, in the meantime. Uh, and with truck drivers who are counting, not in miles, but in hours, because they say that if they were counting miles, they'd go crazy and they'd never get anywhere. Um, and I kind of think of that as um, the interstate as a little bit like a monocrop in some ways, in, in the way that with mass agriculture you have a field where they're growing the crop and nothing else grows within it because it's all about the crop. Likewise on the interstates, it's, it's a car-saturated culture um, where it's sort of not, a, not many signs of human life, and especially as a hitchhiker and occasionally as a pedestrian walking down the highways you really feel that sense of deviance. Um, I would have been picked off the highways many times by state troopers saying that it's illegal to, illegal to hitchhike in the United States uh, and other variants of that saying it's illegal to hitchhike in this state and variants again saying you can't hitchhike here but if you cross the county line then you can hitchhike all right, it's not my turf. Um, so that kind of process always interrupting you. Um, and Interstate won, um, it won an award for, for a travel book of the year last year. Um, I gave half of the prize money to that, to the ACLU, um, at a time when the Muslim ban was just coming in in the US. But largely, more than anything, because the book was, um, I was very conscious in the number of times that I was pulled off of highways by state troopers or, or cops, that although the experience of it was very aggressive, was very forthright, I'd be standing there and a car would pull in. Uh, I'd sort of roll my eyes knowing what was about to happen and then you'd get the microphone on the roof, the loudspeaker on the roof would shriek at me to get, get over to the crash barrier. So I'd go lazily over to the crash barrier um, and then lean on the crash barrier and start un unhooking my bag straps from my shoulders and then it shrieks again and like, don't move, stay there, leave your pack on. Uh, at which point you're okay. And then he comes out and sort of comes up to me and asks if I'm armed, which as a European, it's an absolutely crazy question ever to be asked anyway. Um, and then he pats me down and, you know, we've seen, um, you know, we've all now seen many images of, of black men, generally men, black men and black people shot dead by state troopers in situations that I can really relate to, to having been in. And actually my situation being that bit more deviant, I wasn't even sat at the wheel of my own car. Um, but there's this sense of, the armour of, uh, of white skin, the, the sort of the lack of prejudice that came from law enforcement, although they were suspicious of what I was doing, they were sort of nonetheless uh, willing to tolerate it. Some of them even giving me a lift to the edge of the county line and taking me along a little bit on my way. And by the time I got out of the car, us having some, you know, some kind of conversation and, and forming a bit of a relationship. And, and similarly, although Hitchhiking in the States was often a case of counting cars, and sometimes you'd count 10, you get really lucky, and, um, and you get another ride after 10. Sometimes you'd still be counting after 200. But I have no doubt whatsoever that those numbers would be a lot higher, uh, especially in certain parts of the country were I not white. So there's a, an interesting sort of intersection with, with race at the roadsides in, in that way. Um, and the truck stop is another kind of insight on, on the US in itself. Um, and I spent a lot of my time in truck stops, going, 
going round the rigs that were parked in, uh, occasionally taking a break and sitting down and getting myself a coffee in the canteen. And, and these places are generally what is known in the US as a, as a food desert, which is a concept that I think might be coming to parts of Europe as well, which isn't, isn't a great thing. Uh, but places where there's no fresh produce, there's no fresh vegetables, and everything that you can buy to eat uh, is packaged, uh, is made from refined flour, refined sugar, which kind of slowly has a sort of gently debilitating effect on your sort of sense of kind of will to go on, I think, when you can't look forward to your next meal at any point. Um, the other thing about the truck stops was how, how martial the culture was. I remember being conscious of this very sort of military edge to um, the, the stenciled images that drivers had put on their cabs. Uh, I remember going down the highway and one of them next to me with a, a silhouetted man with a rifle um, kneeling over a fallen comrade and it says, we will honour their sacrifice. Uh, I remember walking into a shop and there's a big American flag on the, uh, on the side of it um, in a truck stop and saying the American flag does not um, flutter with the wind but the last breaths of all who died for it which is a really intense thing when you're just looking for some orange juice or something. Um, but you kind of see this massive sort of sentimentality and emotional investment placed into the, the area of, of the truck stop. Um, because you have guys here that are driving, well, as, as the adverts on the back of some of the rigs will attest, for a cent a mile, which is uh, evidence, I think, of both how crazily enormous the US is, but also how incredibly poorly paid truck drivers are. Um, I remember as well the truck stop uh, shops often had toys in, which was unusual for this population of slightly surly adult men, but they are of course often, if not always, absent fathers. You know, you'll, sometimes you'll see a trucker with his, uh, with his dog, sometimes a trucker with his dog and his wife, maybe sometimes his wife has also got a trucker license and they share the, share the wheel and go back and forth across country. Um, but often they are just absent fathers away from their families, so you'd see the toys there as soon as you walk into the truck stop. Uh, and again, this very martial culture, the, um, you know, toy tanks, toy soldiers. Um, again, because I feel that on the roads with this fairly sort of modern surf existence of, of driving someone else's rig just to stay afloat in America, you need to feel that you're part of something bigger, that the, that the cargo you're moving corresponds somehow in a small way to the American dream that you're possibly getting short sold on, um, but nevertheless have to believe in because if not, why would you carry on? Um, there are also the, the kind of more interesting characters of, of the truck stops um, and, and, and a lot of humanity in amongst it as well. Uh, my ride after Columbus, Ohio, I would have hitchhiked down towards Cincinnati uh, where I got a really nice ride with, um, it was a retired, well, reluctantly retired local radio DJ who'd been put out of work by, by automation, essentially, which is a theme of the book. Um, because in the old days he would have gone into the studio for five days of the week and spun records. Now he only needs to go in for sort of two hours on a Monday morning to say, next up is Casey and the Waves and it's a good morning here in Cincinnati uh, because the rest of it can all be put into a playlist. So you've got this guy who would have been, he, he said, you know, I used to be able, wouldn't be able to sleep at night. I was so excited about my job. Uh, and I met him on a Sunday and he was just going out for a drive for something to do. Uh, he, he took me down to a truck stop outside of Cincinnati and there eventually I met, I invested at that truck stop about a day of time just walking between rigs, got offered a ride by, um, by a Bosnian, um, Bosnian migrant uh, trucker who had a, a vehicle recovery, a big vehicle recovery rig and he was driving down to Mississippi, which wasn't quite on my route for California, but it would have taken me a few hundred miles. I thought I could get a bit bigger than that, and so I kept walking, and eventually I met Pala, uh, who is kind of the hero of the book in loads of ways, because we spent five days together, and we would have driven from, um, from there in Cincinnati, back north towards Lexington, Ohio, to pick up 30,000 kilograms of laminate-wrapped plastic that was then going to be driven down to Yuma, Arizona, uh, on the Mexico border where it would be wrapping up courgettes or zucchinis coming over from Mexico as produce. So it was my sort of 3,000 mile ride that was going to get me most of the way to California and so 
Palo was my man sort of thing. Um, and we spent five days or so together. Um, and those five days were probably, certainly the easiest in terms of moving miles, but also in terms of actually having a kind of human encounter were definitely the, the easiest and the, the best um, period within, within the entire trip. Um, Pala is from the Punjab in, in north of India. He's, he's been 10 years uh, in the United States, approximately. Uh, he kind of has to pay rent to the bank on, on his cab, on the cab of his truck. Um, but he nevertheless is in the position where one day he will own it, uh, the f the, which is unusual and very fortunate, and he's very grateful for that position. And the, the fact that he is in that position is a, an evidence of the diaspora Punjabi community in the US. He had a cousin who's an architect in San Francisco who makes good enough money that he could sign to be the guarantor on the debt for his cab, which means that Pala can one day make his own money rather than just being a servant of a trucking company. Um, nevertheless, there are still these sort of uh, interesting and intricate ways by which he goes about making a living in the US and, and staying healthy in particular. Um, he's a Sikh um, and thus a vegetarian, which in the US is probably not a bad way of staying that bit healthier, especially at truck stops. Um, and it was an incredible experience for me to be in the sort of backwaters of, of Missouri or Oklahoma eating paratas because Pala would have been well in touch with the Punjabi trucking community that is dotted across the roadsides of the US, uh, would have spoken, spoken with a kind of grudging respect for the Gujarati trucking community, which he says works that little bit harder and that little bit smarter, so they now, they now own all of the truck stops and the Punjabis just drive the trucks. Uh, but we would have been there eating our paratas, eating our dal and our tali in, in New Mexico, in Indiana. Um, and, and just having this, this fan fascinating insight on a, on a different part of US culture, and especially US road culture, which is often very kind of forceful and, and, and inhuman, and you're shut off from a community there. Uh, because everyone's living this isolated existence where they're just trying to get from A to B and everything that happens in between is almost like an inconvenience. And so for me and Pala to spend those five days hanging out was, um, was really, really valuable. Um, and I mean, some of the things that he would have talked about, uh, the one that always stays with me, or a couple that stays with me most of all, he remembered that he'd voted for Obama in, uh, in 2012 but he wasn't sure if he'd voted for the Republicans or the Democrats, which was, I thought, a really kind of nice insight on what people say about polarization, which is certainly an issue in, in modern, modern politics, modern communication. I found it really striking that more than the polariz polarization there, what you saw was just a disconnect, a disconnection, an apathy, and a, a political system that was completely irrelevant from his daily life on the roads. Um, the most endearing thing of Pala was his love of field hockey. Um, and he would have talked about as a child in the Punjab, his mum having to ground him or tell him off because she found him practicing his field hockey strokes late at night in his bedroom. And the best part of it was that in modern America, uh, his survival pr regime involved partly going back to the Punjab for two months of every year so that he could play field hockey. Um, and therefore stay healthy, because he couldn't afford health insurance. So he would get another cousin to drive his rig on his behalf for those two months. He went home and played field hockey to stay healthy. Um, there was one time when I, I asked him, I said to him, as we, we were by a tornado shelter, which they have at the, the interstate roadsides for when tornadoes come through. It was, um, it was a shelter in Texas that Pala wanted to stop at and show me because he loved it, because it was so quiet. And as we were walking back to the cab and doing our stretches, having had our sort of five days of vegetarian food in Oklahoma and, and Texas, I was like, Pala, we must be the healthiest guys in any truck in, in, a, in the United States. He's like, no, no, my cousin is a trucker. Uh, he does 45 minutes yoga in his cab every day. Um, and again, I, I, that's the sort of theme of the book that I'd hope comes through it. I think it has um, for some. This kind of, this human, this human humanity, this human spirit that's kind of wrapped inside the metal capsule of a car or of a truck or of the industrial economy of, of a modern, modern nation. Uh, somewhere on the highways of the US, there's a Punjabi trucker doing yoga stretches behind those curtains. Um, and I always found that an incredibly heartening thing. Um, 
that's sort of migratory thing as well, whether it's from Punjabis coming from the Punjab to work the US, or, and speaking of the fact that the Gujaratis have a head start on them because every, every cousin of a newcomer from, from Gujarat who's already in the US will put forward $10,000 so that the n next person in, in has like a $50,000 pot to start from. All of these kind of moments of globalization which is actually, much as it shouldn't be as low pay as it is, and it should be with more rights and protections, uh, is globalization working in the way that it should? And, and also f with the, the, the trail of um, plastic from Ohio, recycled plastics going from Ohio down to Arizona to wrap courgettes that have been grown in, in Mexico. This sort of almost invisible commerce that underpins the lunches that we eat in a city um, and, and the global supply chain that we rely on and can take for granted in our daily lives. You kind of see that out on the roads and, and in all my books and all my journeys, that's kind of been a theme as a result of going to sort of uh, less seen places. Um, from Arizona, Pala and I, we would have gone Cincinnati down into uh, Mississippi Oh, my, my geography of this journey has faded a little, down into Mississippi, um, along and across to, um, towards Texas via Oklahoma, the top of Texas, New Mexico, Arizona. I got out of the Ca uh, Grand Canyon Flagstaff, walked and hitchhiked a little bit further and then came to San Francisco and returning essentially to that, um, you know, the bubble, if you like. Um, from, from New York City and Brooklyn back to the mission of San Francisco. Although, again, I'd sort of question to what extent these places are bubbles, certainly walking through the mission district any time after eight o'clock um, on an evening doesn't feel much like a bubble. And uh, the, the scenes there are any, every bit similar to having visited refugee camps in Calais or in, in Greece. There are people that have kind of been washed up, uh, destitute from a society that doesn't take them or doesn't have space for them. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that's kind of a, a key thing. Uh, much as we, we think of ourselves as, as disconnected in cities, the sort of victims or the hardships of the modern city, the modern economy are, of course, all, all around us. Um, I think um, I just wanted to close, really, on a on note of what the book is and what the journey was in terms of optimism or pessimism, essentially. And I think optimism is an eternal US trait which is potentially the one thing that can save the country from itself in some ways, the fact that there's always hope that we can improve this, we can make it better, we can fix this. Um, and I, the, the tone of the book is very much one of America as a hard place. Um, and it is, because you'll meet a guy at a roadside who's, told, who's obviously got substance abuse problems and has just told you that he's gone and buried his mum within minutes of meeting. Um, You'll pass signs near prisons saying do not pick up hitchhikers because you know 1% of the United States population is in jail and there's a kind of prison industri industry economy attached to that. Um, and so it is a very stark place. I find it very disheartening in lots of ways. But there are the moments within the journey and, and, and within culture and society, the meeting of Pala, the, the guy who's just working for his 10 years before he can start making his own money, but has hope for the future, who has a feeling that actually, I don't understand why people in this world fight. I just want to I just want to work. I just want to make a way for myself. There is also that threaded through <coughs> threaded through the book and, and threaded through the journey. Um, and I, I think the value of the journey is um, something else that I always like to draw attention to. Um, it's, um, I kind of see the world currently as dividing very much between kind of flows and accounts. Um, and flows might be flows of capital or flows of transit, flows of people. Um, and the accounts are the sort of pocketed versions of that that we make for ourselves, that we take security in. And in the internet, we have the social media account in amongst the flow of information. On the highways, you have the, the automobile account where you're, you're safe and it's your place in, in amongst the movement and all of the life that swarms around it. Um, and even in the cities, I mean, I don't normally, I, I used to be a cycle career and um, saw all of the cities and uh, spent a lot of time just on the streets looking at what was going on around me. And I think increasingly in a modern development such as this one even, you see the, the architecture is very much 
done as if an account. It's, um, it's a controlled, localised place that's designed to make one feel at home, but often at the expense of that random act of life or moment or chance that you, you encounter as a, as a matter of course when cycling between places or when hitchhiking and sort of opening yourself to that sense of possibility. Um, and obviously being at Google and, and working in search, um, again, that's sort of, that's uh, a model that often filters us towards accounts that we're comfortable with and, and moves us away from anything that we think we might not like as a result of past performance. Uh, and I think it's always important to question, you know, what are we losing to those moments? What are we losing to that reliance on a sense of security um, and a desire for it and, and to repeat the past in, in the future that we build for ourselves? Um, so I think that's kind of key to the journey, hitchhiking, and certainly uh, all that I write about and, and my projects. And um, yeah, I, I hope that that was an interesting reflection on sort of 5,000 miles across the United States uh, in the age of Donald Trump. <laughs> Thank you very much. And we do have time for questions. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, I have a couple of questions. We just changed the microphone, but okay. Um, the first one, how does it feel to be absolutely alone on this road, you know, this journey? So you're, you're on you are alone, especially how did you keep yourself alive being in the si like in the middle of deserts, um, counting up to 200 cars in one row? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, in terms of being alone, I think I've always just done all right with that for one reason. I don't know if I'm a natural loner or something, but um, yeah, I mean, I cycled to Istanbul on, on my own for the first time when I was 20 and kind of, you know, cycling through the Alps and having no one around was sort of the first time that I started feeling actually this is amazing and this is, this is what I like. Uh, I think writing has actually always been a great kind of companion to me because much as the books are true to life, nevertheless, you're kind of creating a sort of slightly external view of what you're doing when you're writing it down, when you're recording it. So it's not exactly a diary. Uh, but it gives you a sense of a space to reflect, um, like to converse with yourself, if you like, via your notepad. Um, and then the states and that sort of physical issues of going between empty space and especially in, in cars or in a truck is comparatively easy um, relative to cycling. I mean, going through the deserts of Central Asia on a bicycle and you've gone 250 miles to cycle between villages. Uh, and maybe you'll get to a, a caravan pulled to the crossroads in the middle of it where there'll be someone will be selling some grilled meat, but maybe you won't. Uh, so yeah, in the States it was comparatively simple for that, just having some, some water with me and uh, yeah, the harder part was finding something that I wanted to actually eat to, to take for my packed lunch kind of thing. <laughs> and you also said that uh, you, like, on the road he, with drivers you talk pretty openly so it was really easy to make a sincere conversation. How does it feel being here when most of uh, human encounters are usually small talk when people don't actually care about each other? Yeah, in the city, you mean? Uh, yeah. Like yeah. I, yeah, it's really true. Um, yeah. I, I think city, cities are interesting environments for me. I mean, or, or quite challenging in some ways, especially a city as developed and controlled as London, essentially. Um, you know, everyone, there's lots of very high paid people here, there's lots of companies making a lot of money, and so everyone has a very sort of predetermined agenda and, and route, and, and I think that kind of removes a lot of the opportunity for chance encounters. Um, but they are still there, and I think you just have to appreciate them when they come. And it's, I mean, riding a bicycle is essential to me in London, and that small moment of agreeing with someone, even about the weather at traffic lights, is, is great. I had a brilliant moment a couple of weeks back having an electrical device repaired at a shop in Stoke Newton, a guy who's been there forever. Um, and we were just making the small talk. Um, and it was Wednesday, it was Prime Minister questions, questions time, he had it on TV. And a Tory backbencher had asked a question about Christianity and the importance of protecting the world's Christians, which of course I'm completely down with. Um, but I, you know, I, I said, uh, yeah, I'd like if they talked more about persecution of Muslims as well. I'm, I'm half Turkish and it, it's an issue that Islamophobia and the Tory party concerns me. Um, and I said that and he said that. And then 
he said, um, he's like, paradise is a roundabout, and we all are going to the same roundabout, just on different roads. This is Allah's world, and the Christian road and the Muslim road, they go to the same place. And we're there with like solder around and wires hanging over the place in this basement on Church Street, Stoke Newington. And the man's just evangelizing to me about the, the need for the world's religions to kind of come together and be as one. And, and so it does happen. I think independent businesses are really good for it as well as you know, the way that we travel. Um, uh, yeah. Do you have any photos of yourself, of yourself from the journey? Because you showed uh, the photos of places. Yeah. But like, it's interesting how yeah. it doesn't look different. Yeah, <laughs> I'm from that one, I, uh, I have a couple of selfies from that one. Uh, didn't sh I look I look pretty grisly uh, from the round the cycling around the world I have a lot more because I broke a world record for it and Guinness wanted uh, ratification stuff so they wanted to see that I was actually in those places um, yeah they must exist somewhere on the internet <laughs> Maybe I missed this earlier, but uh, so the book is about Emre. Is that you as well? Yeah, yeah so, so Emre is my middle name, and it's just a, a way of um, creating a slight distance between. I mean, it, it's, okay. it's what happened to Julian, but it's my written persona in that book. <laughs> uh, that's interesting. Did, do you find that that sort of helps you to think about it in the third person a little bit more? Yeah, slightly. And um, I think when you're putting something out for public consumption, it's kind of just nice to, you know, when it is your life. And there are elements in there that are personal. So it's just kind of, yeah, wanting to create that sort of small buffer. But yeah, it's a, definitely a, <laughs> a good point. My publisher had a couple of things to say about it as well. <laughs> How much of the book did you write when you were on the road as opposed to later on? And, and how, how were you writing it, like laptop, phone? Yeah, I, I always write in a notepad, really. I, I don't think I've ever traveled with a laptop. Um, and I was just scribbling down in my notepad. And generally, I must have written about half of it, um, half of it while I was out on the road. I mean, occasionally with Paller in his truck talking about his life and, uh, you know, daily life and the truck of trucker community occasionally i just start scribbling down and be like oh you can't put this in a book um so i'd make my notes there um, occasionally i was just really like profoundly kind of impacted by what had happened my penultimate ride was a guy in the central valley of california in a very sort of depressed agricultural communities and he couldn't take me as far as he wanted to because he was on parole and it would violate the terms of his parole um, you know, he, he was a guy that told me that he doesn't keep many friends because they get him into trouble, uh, which was just such a profoundly sad thing to be told by another human, human being. So things like that, I would have just been, I would have finished the ride and I'd just make time to write always, really. Um, just because it's, it's a way, it becomes a way of processing after a while of travel. I have a question. Uh, you mentioned that you uh, were also a psycho courier in London, I guess. Um, so what kind of memorable experiences do you make in this role rather than, like, I guess it's very different? Yeah, I mean, it has a similar kind of quality. It's sort of, um, it's always, the, there's some element of being a human cog in a mechanical machine when I think you're traveling in that way, I think is a big part on the bicycle or hitchhiking. Uh, I mean, memorable moments of, as a courier um, 2008 and the financial crisis and you know riding from the EC2 square mile out to Canary Wharf to Lehman Brothers to deliver receivership notices worth you know, 33 billion dollars and getting paid two pound fifty for each delivery was a very kind of interesting perspective on a collapse of the world economy uh, or equally taking bouquets of flowers from hedge funds in Mayfair to brothels um, so it's kind of, yeah, like the first book, Life Cycles, is sort of, I saw it as globalization at the roadsides, and then Messengers was the second book, and that to me was the globalized city sort of thing. So there's always that, yeah, humans looking at modernity kind of thing going on, hopefully. <laughs> so can I can ask a question as another cyclist. Um, well, do you still cycle around London and um, 
you know, what, what's your opinion of cycle uh, lanes and facilities in London? And if you could change one thing there, what, what would that be? That's a good question. Yeah, I'm definitely still a cyclist in anywhere I go, really. It's kind of just my way of travel, um, including in London. Um, I cycled down to Victoria yesterday and went along the embankment. Uh, which is now, as you've probably mostly seen, this nice wide segregated cycle path that only got put in a few years ago. And I just, yeah, it gives me a great optimism that there are so many more people visibly getting around on bikes. And that actually the architecture of the city is changing to reflect that. Um, there was a great moment by Waterloo Bridge a couple of years back when that uh, cycle route had first been put in. And there's actually a wider pavement also that sort of separates that cycle track from, from where the road is and where the traffic is. And that wider pavement would have been a lane of traffic three years ago. And I remember seeing an old couple, uh, and it's always nice seeing old couples being romantic together anyway, but they were like having a pro prolonged goodbye and a kiss goodbye on that bit of former road that's now a wide pavement. And it was just, I remember looking at it and thinking, well, two years ago, that space exactly there was just a line of s smoking, gnarling, impatient traffic. And now it's actually a you know, a place that humans have, you know, humans can actually stand and be as humans in. So I, you know, I think that is kind of increasingly the culture of, of the modern city and, and cars have less and less place in it, which I think is a, a positive trend. Um, and I hope that London can sort of carry on progressing with any luck. Um, at the start, you mentioned uh, about, about your around the world cycling record, and you, you felt the the whole process of around the world cycling had become very uh, commercialised and sort of like been sort of somewhat devalued by all the sponsorship into it. And I think that's kind of probably a trend that's continued since then as well. Um, did how did you feel as you went through that process and and completed it? Um, like the fact that you were doing the Guinness. Um, attributions for or, or getting the, the proof for that and, and going through the Guinness process, did that feel quite commercialised anyway or, yeah. or you know, did, did you feel like you got you yeah. achieved what you wanted with that? No, really good, good perceptive question and absolutely mm. like when I was, things like making a notes on my daily log and stuff like that seemed fine, you know, my mile, my start point, my finish point, all of that was, was fine but yeah, taking uh, a photo of myself with a redwood <laughs> and things like that. And the redwoods in particular were quite an interesting place to ride through, the redwood forest of Northern California. You're there with a, a tree that was started growing at the time of the Roman Empire and it's still growing and you're on this silly sort of like six month quest to break a record when you're not really a competitive person. So um, <laughs> yeah, well, apparently not a competitive person. Um, yeah, so it was a bit strange and it's kind of a mixture of sort of necessity and, and uh, just seeing it through really in the end. I really hadn't liked the corporate approach. I misrepresented it in terms of kind of the meaning of life on the open road as something that was for sale to banks and investment funds, but also misrepresented it as something that was, you know, this unpleasant alpha male man against the world thing where time and again, it's the world that actually helps you along. Um, and so I kind of wanted to show that it could be done differently. And actually it was a lot of fun that it, um, that it wasn't as hard as it had been made to look or was un unpleasant at all as an experience. Um, and then halfway through, you know, I'd been a courier in London anyway, so I was going off funds of that. And so come the midpoint, I kind of needed to finish because I was going to run out of money anyway. So there's always that kind of like wolf at the door to make sure you keep going. Thank you again, Julian Syrah. Thank you.